what Stolen says and some of the other people. Uh, a lot that I'm going to deal with today is placing what is happening to us in a historical perspective. One thing I want you to understand, when individuals go to the police academy, they only learn 20% really of what it takes to be a police officer in Ontario. The other 80% really is taught to them on on-the-job training. So I do applaud Andre Moran looking into the training of police officers, because it's within that training, that in-house training, that all of the negative ethos of the thin blue line and the, everything that goes with it becomes inculcated into these young men and women, so that they no longer serve and protect the public, but they serve and protect the thin blue line and each other. My name is Ruben Abib, and I'm actually a senior activist with the Black Act Defense Committee. But today I'm here representing the National Conference of Black Lawyers, Toronto Chapter, and the Never Again Coalition. I sit before you this morning dressed in a hospital gown. It is uncomfortable, and it is symbolic. It is uncomfortable, and it is symbolic. On February 3rd, 2012, Michael Elegon Jr. was gunned down while wearing a hospital gown not dissimilar to the one I wear today. That Michael needed help did not matter. He did not obey and he died. <coughs> Here we are less than 18 months later in the morning and activating for Sam Yatin, another young soul taken from his family and his future by the Toronto Police excessive force. I want to break down a little bit of what I believe are a few uncommon excuse me, uncommon symbolic facts which you may or may not know about the Toronto Police, Ontario <coughs> Police in general, and the SIU. From 1995 to today, the SIU has investigated 87 firearm deaths by police, 338 custody deaths by police, 16 other types of deaths by police, for a grand total of 441 deaths at the hands of police in Ontario, 441 since 1995. Charges laid by the SIU on officers for excessive force, manslaughter, or murder, I believe the number is three, with one conviction. That is a minus 441 average against the victims and families of police violence. I want to travel back in history a little bit. Um, you'll be hearing from the Black Action Defense Committee. I sit here today with an image of Dudley Laws on my chest, and I carry the mentorship of Charles Roach within me. And for many years, these men were standing up very much alone. And I'm very happy to be here with the Ontario Federation of Labor and have all of you here today. Many times in the past, we have been very lonely and without you. But let's travel back a little bit to 1901 and begin to plot the number of violent deaths by firearms of Toronto police at the hands of criminals from 1991 until 2012. Today, you will find in 112 years, 17 young men have paid the ultimate supreme sacrifice of their lives in the line of duty. 17 men have died violent deaths by the hands of criminals in the Toronto police force in 112 years. May Toronto and Canada truly honor these fallen Toronto police officers. They too died unnecessarily. Yet in every case except for one, there was an arrest and a conviction. <coughs> Yet the SIU investigated 17 police killings by firearm alone between 1995 and 1999. Between 2000 to 2008, when Ian Scott took over, there were 41 police killings. In Ian Scott's tenure, he has had 29 police killings by firearm. And how many charges laid? One. How many convictions? None. I'm cognizant of the time, and we'll wrap up here in but a few moments, but I do so once again by delving into the history of brutal, violent, and righteous disregard for human rights, perpetrated especially but not exclusively by the Toronto Police Services. Something maybe you, many of you don't know. The origin of Toronto Police Services began officially in 1834 when Toronto was officially incorporated. The 
Between 1834 and 1859, 1860, there were 26 riots in Toronto, because of which the role of police officer in Toronto began as a paramilitary rebellion suppressor. It was not about fighting crime. It was about suppressing rebellion. Crime fighting was not much of a concern or a practice. In its early years, corruption in the Toronto police force was rife. And the entire police services was removed not once but three times. Every officer, every uh, every senior officer, gone before 1859. When it finally came time to hire uh, a chief who would reinvent the force in 1859, Toronto had a choice. Um, excuse me. They had a choice uh, in 1855. They wanted to look to London, England, to choose an officer from there to come to Toronto to make a police force based on the police force in London, England. But they didn't actually do that. When it came to hire a chief for the new Toronto police force in 1859, Toronto instead chose a military officer and not a pro an experienced police officer. The new police chief was William Stratton Prince, a former <coughs> captain of the 71st Highland Light Infantry Division, who saw much battle. Stratton Prince standardized training, hiring practices, and new strict rules of discipline and professional conduct were introduced. Today's Toronto Police Services directly traces its ethos, constitutional lineage, and police commission regulatory structure to these 1859 reforms by Stratton Prince. An ironic note, William Stratton Prince was the son of Colonel John Prince, who commanded the forces engaging the rebels at Windsor in 1838 in the rebellion between the United States and Canada where he summarily shot rebel prisoners captured by his men. If Toronto was more concerned about rebellion and disorder than crime fighting, then certainly they had a new police chief in uh, Stratton Prince, with rebel fighting both in his blood and his regimental history. Since those long ago, day, long ago days of uh, Chief Stratton <coughs> Prince, the Toronto Police has grown incredibly to where it now has a $1 billion budget but along with this growth also has come a misplaced sense of entitlement in a force who publicly proclaim to serve and protect, but actually prepare to suppress rebellion in any form. It may be difficult for you to get beyond the uncomfortable symbolism of the ethos of Toronto police today is that their ancestral paramilitary rebellion suppression role. But that is what they're Toronto police trained for, suppression of rebellion. That is why they are armed as they are. And so it is not 9 millimeter they carry. They carry Glock 27s or Glock 22, so they're 10 millimeter, 40 caliber bullets, hollow point bullets. They have a muzzle velocity almost just a little, under, a little bit under half of an assault rifle. <coughs> this is what they are trained for. This is why they are armed. This is why they are armored. This is what they practice daily. This is what they yearn to fulfill, rebellion suppression. Unfortunately, even a rebellion shaded as a refusal to, do, to divulge one's personal information for no reasonable cause, or to refuse, stop being, to refuse to stop being in crisis and respond as they order us. To the police in Ontario, and especially to the Toronto Police Services, this small act of rebellion evokes an ingrained and entitled blue line mandate for them to begin the dangerous escalation of their continual force protocol, <coughs> where by all means necessary, they will command you they will control you, they will subdue you, or they will hurt you, and maybe, likely, they will even kill you. When the police happens, the uncomfortable symbolism of justice and I occur. On the one hand, you have a person who just died, was brutally shot or beaten or otherwise killed by police, with their shocked, bereaved, and overwhelmed families facing hopelessly the financial and legal reality of bad news, worse news. And finally, injustice. On the other hand, you have a well-paid, middle-class police officer who just killed somebody. Mm -hmm. Yet he knows he's sleeping in his own bed that night. He knows he will get one year off with pay. He knows his union will part the seas to protect him. He knows the SIU is mandated in the very belly of his own police act. He knows police culture will be used in the SIU investigation. He knows the media will howl. He knows the families will cry. He knows, he knows, he knows that he most likely 
will not be charged. He knows coroner's inquests are rare, and no guilt is assigned or investigated. He knows civil suits are possible, but they always settle, with gag orders restricting families' comments. He also knows most victim families will not bother with a civil case because they can't afford a lawyer, can't get legal aid, can't find a pro bono lawyer. He knows they will eventually forget and fade away. The Ontario Police, and especially the Urban Brothers, the Toronto Police Services, the service officer knows his life will continue. The police officer knows he will never be held to account in this city, in this province, in this country. The police know they are free to kill, they are free to maim, to brutalize, to hurt, to intimidate, to cheat, and to lie. The police know and hold true to that eternal, symbolic, thin blue line of injustice and treat it as an entitlement. And our elected politi politicians continue to allow them to get away with it. As Joel Duff of the Ontario Federation of Labor remarked to me yesterday, the system is broken from the top to the bottom. Justice Adams stated in his 2003 report that the SIU is an important democratic tool for building the community's trust in the paramilitary organization we call police. Yet I tell you today, it has failed. A total rethink to real community-based policing is necessary. A system of real civilian oversight must be made a reality. How do we do that? Where do we start? I will end by honoring our great, late great mentors, Dudley Laws and Charles Roach, by leaving with you a few demands to chew on. Number one, to Premier Kathleen Wynne, fire or transfer Deputy Attorney General Patrick Monaghan and his Assistant Deputy <coughs> Attorney General of Agency Relations, Ali Arlani. Get rid of these two. They are a part of the problem, buffering and filtering reality, realities to the elected echelon that are not the realities that the victims are facing on the street and their families are facing every day. Get rid of these bureaucrats. They have been there too long and they're not doing the job that we gave them. Number two, fire or transfer out of the SIU, William Curtis, 22-year veteran of the Guelph Police Services, who is now listed on as the SIU Executive Director on the Attorney General's online organizational <coughs> chart. Now, if Ian Scott is the director and William Curtis is the executive director, what is up with that? And William Director is the one, William Curtis is the one who was answerable from the SIU to the Assistant Deputy Attorney General. And he's a cop. This is civilian oversight. This is the blockage there. Get rid of this man. This position should be equally sacrosanct as a citadel of civilian oversight of police. This position is the conduit and key to the ear of the elected echelon. Number three, <coughs> fire Ian Scott. He is a good man, but not the man for this job. He lacks the will to ensure justice, even if it looks a losing cause. He lacks the will to let a judge and jury decide. Instead, preventing justice, denying justice to the victims, families, by never charging. Remove Ian Scott. Number four, <coughs> remove the SIU from the Ontario Police Act and establish it as it was originally intended, as a direct arm of the Attorney General. It can no longer. Being within the Ontario Police Act is like trying to see your nose from the inside of your belly button. It does not work. Number five, order a full judicial review of all historic SIU cases involving death or injury by police. It is clear that we have a problem in the system. Number six, work and this I hope Andre Moran will also uh, work very hard to, to bring into reality work with the federal government to define and establish the tertiary curriculum for a civilian forensic homicide investigator program utilizing the existing universities in Ontario and Canada the ethos now in the government and in the judiciary is that the only people who can investigate a homicide are police it is a lie. They are blocking anybody else from getting the experience because they want to remain behind the thin blue line. Ladies and gentlemen, as Ruth Schaefer and many of the other families have said, we need to act. We do need to write letters. We do need to stand up. And today, we do need to march. <coughs> A year ago, at the Toronto Police Services Board, I wore this hospital gown. And it says, never again. 
when 18 months ago we said never again that we wanted changes. Why are we here today mourning and activating for Sami Yatim? This is a political decision. The police will not change on their own. Let us not even talk to them too much. Let us change the politics. Thank you very much. Which I do so in memory and honor of Michael Elegon Jr. who was shot by police when he needed them most. I don't want to stay long. This day is about Sammy and his family. If you really know what his family are going through. In 1988, when the Black Action Defense Committee was formed, it was formed because we had an ideal that we would stop this happening. We would stop the police indiscriminate killing. Today is 2012. And young Sammy, who was not even alive, 2013. And young Sammy, who was not even alive when we formed, is dead. Yes. From the very same injustice that we were fighting against 30 years ago. We stand here today in front of the belly of the beast, but this is well armed and well armored. Every single policeman you see, every clip he has on him has 15 rounds. 40 caliber 10 millimeter hollow point bullets. Every time they pull their weapon, it's attempted murder. Yes. They do not shoot to wound. They do not shoot to scare. They only shoot to kill. I want to say right now that there are many good policemen, but the thin blue line that the bad ones hide behind corrupts the rest of them. Andre Moran is on their case. We have to support him. Yeah. But who is going to support us? No. What about our politicians? Each and every one of you have MLAs. Each and every one of you have MPs. Each and every one of you have MPPs. Make sure they receive a letter from you today on behalf of Sammy Yatim, on behalf of Michael Elegon, on behalf of Hugh Dawson, on behalf of all the others. I thank you.